On the Scarlowy Railway, just before it leaves Lakeside, the line passes a manor house that has fallen into disrepair. It was called Montague House, after a wealthy family who once lived there. No one quite knew what to do with it. Some argued it should be restored and made into a tourist attraction. Some wanted it to be demolished completely. However, those who knew of its history argued that it should be left alone, and so the Sodor Trust, a trust dedicated to keeping alive many elements of Sudrian history, claimed it as theirs and forbade anyone to change it. Most of the little engines remained silent, as did the coaches whenever they passed the house. They were well aware of its dark past, and couldn't bear the thought of the old house, a final mark of respect to those who perished being demolished. The exception to this was Duncan. He grumbled on and on about why the house was still standing in the first place. It's just a colossal waste of space, he complained one morning in the shed while he was being prepared for work. Why would anyone want to keep a crumbling old ruin if they're not even going to use it? Peter, Sam and Scar Lowy groaned and looked at each other. By the way Duncan usually complained, he made Edwin Richards look like the world's most patient engine, but this time Duncan had gone too far. However, Scar Lowy knew Duncan had acted in this manner before, and when Peter Sam opened his mouth to protest, he wisely told him, Not a word, Peter Sam. We'll never get him to listen when he's like this. He won't understand until he's seen it. Ivo Hugh is the youngest of the Scarlowy engines, but even so, he is still prone to mechanical faults. These are mostly due to his bouncy nature, and that he is still young and full of his own grandeur and self-importance. He had been praised recently by the tool controller for his hard work bringing goods down from the quarry to be loaded onto boats at Lakeside. Not for the first time this had gone into his funnel. I am hard working, he thought, and if I keep this up I shall be the hardest working engine on this railway. Harder and harder he puffed through the night with his final train of the day, the trucks rattling and screeching behind him. Steady on, boy, exclaimed his driver as he fought for control. We're not running a race or anything. Of course I know that, complained Ivo Hugh. I just... But he never finished his sentence. A loud burst of steam erupted from him and he slowed to a stop. Oh, whatever happened, exclaimed Ivo Hugh. I feel so weak. His driver jumped down and inspected his engine. Oh, history just has to repeat itself, he muttered before explaining. You burst your safety valve. You can't pull the train anymore. Ivo Hugh groaned. Oh dear, the others will say I'm as bad as Gordon now. His driver looked still more disappointed. His fireman spoke up. Come on, Dan, let's get help from up the line. The driver looked uncertainly at him. We don't have a choice, whispered the fireman to him. So they damped down his fire, told the guard, who placed detonators on the track to protect his train and took shelter in his van, and they ran up the line as fast as their legs could carry them. Ivo Hugh was all alone. But not for long. After his driver and fireman disappeared in the distance, he felt a distinct chill in the air. He shuddered and looked around him. Then he saw a figure standing by a nearby lake, staring up at the manor. It was a young man. Excuse me, asked Ivo Hugh, is there something the matter? The man just carried on staring. Ivo Hugh blinked, certain he could hear him from that far off. Then he gasped. The man had disappeared. Wondering if he was seeing things, he blinked again. There was the man again, this time standing right in front of the house. Ivo Hugh screamed and closed his eyes tight. He didn't open them until Rusty came to rescue him. The little diesel took one look at Ivo Hugh and sighed mournfully. <sighs> the poor young engine. Such a terrible thing to see. 
such a terrible thing to happen to both of them, he murmured, before taking Ivo Q back to the last station, where Sir Handel, grumbling about having to work late until he told him what had happened to Ivo Q, was waiting to take the young engine home, while he took the trucks to Lakeside. The next day, Ivo Q was shunted into the workshops, still quivering from his ordeal. Reneas saw this, and after glancing sadly at Scarloe, sidled into the works alongside. I know you've had a trying night, Ivo Q, he said, and I think you'll understand when I tell you this. Because of Ivo Hughes' breakdown, Duncan was put in charge of his trains. What does the tall controller mean putting me on Ivo Hughes' goods? That we youngsters just a coward? A fancy being afraid of summit we pass in the daytime. Duke glared crossly at him, but wisely said nothing. He had seen engines like Duncan before, and knew how it would all end. For the rest of the day, Duncan rushed along the line, trying to do Ivo Hughes' work as well as his own. The problem was that because of his rushing, he often went over the line's speed limit, despite his crew's efforts to keep him under control. Goods were damaged, passengers were bumped and slightly injured, and everyone said what a bad railway it was. But the worst was yet to come. Duncan had one last job to do before he set off home. This was to take the last load of freight from the yard to Lakeside. By this point, he was desperate for his work to be done soon, and he trucked the trucks as he arranged them. Get to line, you horrible lot, he grumbled. Oh, 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 groaned the trucks. Just wait, we'll pay you back. They had heard about Duncan's rough treatment all day, and were determined to pay him out. They followed quietly when Duncan left the yard and took them up the line towards Lakeside, racing through the dark of the night. Just in front of where Ivo Hugh broke down was a curve leading into Lakeside. It wasn't the sharpest curve on the line, but it was a serious cause for concern for fast trains. Duncan knew this and tried to slow down, but the trucks had other ideas. On, 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 they cried and bashing their buffers pushed Duncan who had already applied his brakes but was still going fast, down the line towards the curve. Oi! shouted Duncan. Stop that! But his demands fell on deaf ears, and he pushed back against the train with all his might. But it was no good. As they rounded a bend, the train tilted and swerved so violently that three trucks behind him lurched and derailed, bringing the whole train to a standstill. Yeah, stupid trucks. Now we'll be late and the tall controller will blame me, grumbled Duncan. If you think that's bad enough, started the fireman, but the driver hushed him. It's that time of night. He'll get his punishment soon enough. Why? asked the fireman. You know where we've stopped, replied the driver. After damping Duncan's fire down, they jumped down and joined the guard who was as white as a sheet and hurriedly placing detonators along the line. You all right, Rod? asked the driver. Just go get help so we can get the train out of this shoddy place, exclaimed the guard. The driver and fireman ran up the line as fast as they could, leaving Duncan on his own. Ah, well, he thought, I'll just go to sleep. But he never did. Suddenly, he felt a feeling of coldness and the sense that he was no longer alone. He looked around and saw a beautiful woman standing at one of the windows of the manor. Duncan was astounded. He had believed that the house was abandoned. Indeed, it looked so, with its smashed windows and web-covered doors. He blinked, just to be sure he wasn't seeing things. The woman was nowhere to be seen. He blinked again to be sure, then almost had a boiler explosion when he saw the woman was now standing on the roof. What? What? What's happening? He cried. The trucks had seen everything and they were frightened too. g g g ghost says panics. I will use ghost! cried Duncan, who then screamed long and loud into the night.
It was morning by the time Fred arrived with the breakdown gang. The tall controller oversaw the operation. He took one look at Duncan's sleep-deprived and pale face. Perhaps that'll teach you not to rush your work, he scolded with a touch of sympathy in his voice. Then he left aboard Fred, who cleared away the trucks so Scarloe could take Duncan back to the sheds. Scarloe could see the state Duncan was in. There is a reason as to why we keep the house still standing, Duncan, he explained. It stands as a mark of respect because of something terrible that happened before I arrived on Sodor. You noticed, I take it, the state the manor is in. Covered in cobwebs, and half of his windows broken. Did you ever see the figure of a woman standing out from the topmost window and then up on the roof? Duncan remained silent, which told Scarlowe the affirmative. The old engine continued. Have you noticed the figure of a man standing by the lakeside when she is gone? Have you heard of a love affair that took place that was never meant to be? That is the life of Lady Jean Montague. Once, her family was the most wealthiest in the land. Her mother, the daughter of a factory owner from Yorkshire. Her father, son of a duke of ancestral heritage. Lady Jean was arranged to marry a man, another man of a similar age. This was the right honourable Sir Frederick Woodhouse son of the Earl of Sussex. But she fell in love with a man below her station, the stable hand, Peter Marlowe. Many a night after she had attended Sir Frederick's countless dinners and visits, she would sneak out of her house, where she and Peter would meet by the lakeside and embrace, their bodies intertwining, their eyes glassy and full of affection. They would only separate when they heard the owls cry before dawn promising each other that they would meet the next night. It was most unfortunate for them that on one such night, the gamekeeper should take a stroll, having failed to sleep. The gamekeeper never made his presence known, but reported his sightings to Lady Jane's father. Enraged, her father locked her away in her room and claimed to all that she had passed away, even forbidding her from any food and water. At the same time, some two days later, by way of coming across the gamekeeper drunk, Sir Frederick learned of Lady Jane's betrayal. He went to the stable, enraged with Peter for apparently stealing from him. Peter was shocked and distraught to hear that his beloved Jane was dead. The two men fought, both strangling each other. Blood flew from both of them as they, being evenly matched in strength, sought to fight each other to the death. Finally, Peter arose and grabbed a knife he always kept for his food, leaving Sir Frederick's lifeless form. He charged through the house, murdering everyone and destroying everything in his way, in his anger at being told what he hoped to be an untruth. He entered the drawing room, where Lord and Lady Montague were announcing their loss to some close friends and killed them without hesitation. Blood spurted all along the walls, a fire started. Any servant who was lucky enough to escape Peter's rampage was burned to death in the inferno that followed. The cries for help that would never come echoed all around the building. The fire smashed the windows and followed Peter as he raced up the stairs to Lady Jane's room. He then forced open the door where she had been imprisoned and was shocked and heartbroken to find that she had indeed suffered without food and water. Her body was dressed in a white nightgown, revealing her shoulders and arms spread lifeless about the bed. Her face, still beautiful, was in an expression of calmness, but the torture she had endured was visible from the gashes of blood upon her back, soaking into her dress, and from her pale complexion and dried up body. The sight was nothing but torture to Peter, who openly cursed himself, fate, and the world they lived in and stabbed himself. It was the only true way they could ever be together. However, even this was never meant to be. The figure by the lake seldom ever appears at the same time as the woman of the house. 
Their looks are often longing, searching for something they can never see. They keep vigilance on a regular basis, but neither are fated ever to be together again. Duncan was touched by the story, and tears rolled down his cheeks as he was hauled home to be shunted into the workshops. The tall controller gave both Ivo, Hugh and Duncan a few days out of work to recover from their ordeal. Both remained shaken up for a long time afterwards, and never talk about what they saw. Duncan kept going with his trains at a much steadier pace for a month afterwards. To this day, he dreads the memory of that terrible night, and from that day to this, he has remained respectfully silent when passing Montague House. Peter and Lady Jane are still there to this day, a reminder to all that love is something which lasts beyond the grave, and that the destruction of something so beautiful such as it is never to be scorned by anyone. They carry on looking for one another, in hopes of finding each other as their hearts desire. Despite what Scarlowy said, Duncan and all the other engines hope they will one day reunite. But I think Scarlowy is right in saying that that can never be. Don't you?